from South Carolina Public Radio, this is the South Carolina Lead. I'm your host, Gavin Jackson, and this episode was recorded on July 5th, 2023 from James Island. Just so you know, some of the information in this podcast may have changed by the time you've heard it. In this episode, we take you to Pickens, where former President Donald Trump held a rally for a reported 50 to 55,000 folks on July 1st, his first rally in the state since announcing his re-election bid late last year. We also have the latest poll data on how the 2024 field is shaping up in South Carolina. The Russ McKinney has a report for us on some legal developments involving the House Freedom Caucus. Victoria Hansen takes us to the newly opened International African American Museum in Charleston. And we have some economic data for y'all since the economy and jobs are the top issues folks want to know about. We got to the econ data, we got you those numbers when we do the numbers. And a programming note, the lead is continuing its summer production schedule next week when we will have another single episode released on Wednesday. And just a heads up for the first week of August, when both of your lead boys will be in Miami for a podcast conference. So stay tuned for that, folks. We might give you a little taste of of the Miami heat when we're in town, okay? And the lead, of course, wants to hear from y'all. That's why we have a voicemail box set up at 803-563-7169. Take us on the road this summer. We're putting the time in, even on our vacations, to keep you guys informed and educated with what's going on in the state. But let us know what you're doing. We love hearing from you guys. 803-563-7169. Happy belated July 4th. And uh, happy summer, folks. On July 1st, former President Donald Trump held his first rally in South Carolina since announcing his re-election campaign last November, and one of his biggest rallies so far this year. The rally took place on Main Street in Pickens, one of the most conservative areas of the state. And thousands of folks from all over came to hear the 45th president complain about injustices he's faced, excoriate his opponents, specifically Ron DeSantis, the Florida governor, They also heard him rip on President Joe Biden and his embattled son, Hunter, and hear a litany of hits while laying out few policy details on how Trump plans to make America great again. But some 50 to 55,000 people, according to the Pickens police chief, bear the 100-degree heat for hours to hear Trump speak in the July sun to rally behind their chosen leader to fight for them in 2024. These were diehard Trump supporters, the folks who make up that base of support that has helped Trump consistently stay at the top of polls, commanding an average 41% in South Carolina, the first in the South primary state. This position is common for him in other early voting states as well. In Pickens, Trump started off his more than hour-long speech by laying out his legal defense and justification for taking more than 300 classified documents with him when leaving the White House at the end of his term in January 2021, something that violates the Presidential Records Act. However, since that does not have a law enforcement mechanism in it, Trump was instead charged with violating the Espionage Act. Here's former President Trump. Former president legally keeping documents. As a president, the law that applies to this case is not the Espionage Act, this vicious, never used before, never, it's only been used on me over boxes that I'm allowed to have the Espionage Act. But the Presidential Records Act which is not even mentioned in this horrible and vicious and stupid, according to very talented lawyers, 44-page indictment, under the Presidential Records Act, which is a civil situation, not a criminal law. I had every right to have these documents, personal belongings and boxes. I had absolute right to have them. Joe Biden didn't, and Mike Pence didn't, and neither did certain other people that weren't presidents because they were not covered by the Presidential Records Act of 1978, relatively new compared to others. But these scoundrels and thugs in our weaponized government are corrupt, just like the president is corrupt. So they decided only to come after me. But let's play some of the greatest hits from the rally in a bit of a lightning round format, huh? Now, Trump derided the Bidens repeatedly, at times even calling them the Biden crime family due to claims and allegations Trump lodged against the family, including Hunter, who has just pled guilty to a federal gun and tax charges. Once again, Trump was right. Trump was right. They have these hats. Trump was right about everything. I don't know about everything, but we were right about a lot, Marjorie, right? A lot. Joe Biden is corrupt, and Joe Biden is a very compromised president. 
He's being paid off just like a common criminal gets paid off, just a more sophisticated manner and much larger numbers. But he's totally protected by the Department of Injustice and by the fake news media, which has been weaponized to a degree we have never, ever seen before. This is a crime 100 times bigger than Watergate, and they just don't want to write about it. When I get back in office, I will appoint a real special prosecutor to investigate every detail of the Biden crime family of corruption. Trump even had this to say about his 2016 rival Hillary Clinton, as he's now opting to give Biden Hillary's nickname, which is a big development. But today, everything having to do with those courageous Americans who fought for us and sacrificed so strongly is indeed being destroyed under crooked Joe Biden, and he is crooked as hell, isn't he? You know, I've been hitting him much differently than I have because I've always respected the office. And then when they indicted me for nothing, I said, now the gloves are off. Now we have to say it like it is. He's a crook. Under crooked Joe Biden, I never called him that. I took the name away from Hillary Clinton. We call her beautiful Hillary now, and because I don't, it was crooked Hillary, now it's crooked Joe, because it's a much more appropriate name. Trump also mentioned several dictators and his thoughts on the Russian coup attempt. When you think of what's going on with Russia, you know, Russia now is at a point where they better make the right decision, because we're on a course toward World War III, And the weaponry is impossible. If you ever saw the kind of power that, the kind of destructive force, and we have a man who's grossly incompetent, who's representing us. And if you look at the leaders of the world, these people are at the top of their game, President Xi and Kim Jong-un, and I could name almost every country. He also noted that our biggest enemy was not a foreign adversary. And I've been saying, people would ask me, who's our biggest enemy? Is it China? Could it be Russia? Could it be North Korea? What about Iran? I said, no, no, no. Our biggest enemy is from within. They're sick people from within. The communists, the Marxists, the fascists. Because if we have the right person running like I was, no wars, no threats of wars, no Russia going into Ukraine, no China talking about Taiwan, wasn't even thinkable, wasn't on the table. Because if we have the right person, but what do they do? They impeach him twice. They go after him like nobody's ever been gone after. Here is just some of the bold agenda that I'll immediately implement when we become, we, we, we become the 47th president of the United States. Even still on the international front, he again said he would end the Russia-Ukrainian war and prevent World War III. Before I even arrive at the Oval Office, shortly after I win the presidency because of you. I will have the horrible war between Russia and Ukraine settled. I'll get it done in 24 hours. I know them both very well. Zelensky and Putin, I'll get it solved very, very quickly. Should have never started, should never have started. All of those people that have been killed would be alive today. All of those cities that are just absolutely demolished would be up, would be prosperous. I am the only candidate who can make this promise, and the promise is I will prevent World War III. Nobody else. As for his adversaries in the 2024 race, Trump on multiple occasions blasted Ron DeSantis, the Florida governor. Unlike Ron DeSanctimonious, who voted to gut Medicare and Social Security and voted three times to raise the retirement age to 70, Ron voted to retain. And you deserve that. You know, you. You deserve what that says. You worked all your life in many cases. Nobody's going to mess around with it. He wanted to raise it to 70. That wasn't the deal. I will always protect Medicare and Social Security for our great seniors. And in four years, I never discussed it. Trump, while talking about a slew of polling data, briefly mentioned Senator Tim Scott and former Governor Nikki Haley, South Carolina's own homegrown Republican presidential candidates who trail even DeSantis in South Carolina polls by a pollster who I just spoke to in the back. We're up 61 points on everybody, 61. That's a lot, that's a lot. In the National Public Affairs poll here in South Carolina, 
We are leading by many, many points. In fact, so points, so many points, they didn't even want to put out a number. They said, they said, whatever the hell it is. And you have, as you know, Tim Scott, who happens to be a good man, by the way. But you have Tim Scott and you have Nikki Haley running. But leading by so much that people don't even want to put out the numbers. They don't even believe them. We have the numbers from that poll Trump quoted in a moment. Now, leading up to his speech, there were several folks who needed medical assistance due to the heat. An hour into his speech, Trump gave folks who hadn't left yet some advice on beating the heat. The heat, it's hot as hell out here, by the way. Hot as hell. But we have to keep going. We have to trudge forward. Right? Who the hell cares? You go home, take a nice cold shower, you'll be fine, right? Now, volunteers were running cases of water constantly to many in the immediate crowd around the stage. There were also pallets of water all around the main street as well for folks to pick up. While people waited, they were serenaded by songs from the classic Trump playlist that included hits from ABBA, Elvis Presley, Toby Keith, even opera classics from The Phantom of the Opera. Trump's Boeing 757, also known as Trump Force One, flew over the downtown area before he landed and took a motorcade to the small upstate town. There was a program of South Carolina speakers leading up to his arrival, including his statewide team that includes Governor Henry McMaster, Lieutenant Governor Pamela Evett, Senator Lindsey Graham, Congressman Russell Fry and William Timmons, and Treasurer Curtis Loftus, as well as former Lieutenant Governor Andre Bauer. In fact, the South Carolina support wasn't even enough. Georgia Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene was at the event as well. Greene received a Trump-like welcome before her 15 minutes of remarks. In fact, all but Senator Lindsey Graham received a warm reception from the crowd. Take a listen to this. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome United States Senator Lindsey Graham. This was one of the worst responses to Graham I've ever seen or heard. With sustained booing, shouts, and chants, even when Graham tried to find some common ground by praising Trump. All right, thank y'all. Thank you all very much. Welcome to Pickens County. A little bit about this county. Just calm down for a second. I think you'll like this. Pickens County has more Medal of Honor winners per capita than any place in the nation. I was born in this county. I live 15 miles down the road. This is a place where people pay the taxes, fight the wars, and tell you what they believe. How many of you believe that Donald Trump was a great president? So let me tell you a little bit about me and President Trump. What happened? I found common ground with President Trump. It took a while to get there, folks. But let me tell you what happened. I come to like President Trump, and he likes himself, and we got that in common. But these folks weren't having it, even when Trump came to his rescue later in his own remarks. We're going to love him. I know. It's half and half. But when I need some of those liberal votes, he's always there to help me get them, okay? We got some pretty liberal people, but he's good. He's good. We know the good ones. We know the bad ones, too. We got some real bad ones. And again, Senator Lindsey Graham, who is really got... I'm going to have to work. I'm going to have to work on these people. I'm going to have to. All right. <laughs> He's, he's, he's there, he's there when you need him. He's there when you need him. I'm going to get him straightened up. Do you mind if I come here and campaign a little bit for you? He, I'll tell you what, he was one of my earliest endorsements right from the go, and I appreciate it very much. I appreciate it, Lizzie. Now, that is a special relationship right there, but that's politics, folks. Now, one upstate politician even texted me to ask about the entire scene with Graham, questioning why he would even subject himself to that. I said 2026 isn't that far away for Graham. Now, later, the last six or so minutes of Trump's speech included dramatic music in the background as he listed failures under Biden and summarized how he plans to make America great again. We are a nation in decline. 
We are a failing nation. We are a nation that has the highest inflation in 50 years, where banks are collapsing and interest rates have gone through the roof. Likewise, we are a nation where energy costs have reached the highest in our history. We are no longer energy independent or energy dominant like we were just a few short years ago. Trump also mentioned the trials and tribulations of air travel and dirty airports. A nation whose once revered airports are dirty. They're a crowded mess. You sit and wait for hours and then are notified that the plane won't leave and they have no idea when it will. Where ticket prices have tripled, they don't have the pilots to fly the planes, they don't see qualified air traffic controllers anymore, and they just don't know what they're doing. Like he did in January when he rolled out his state leadership team, Trump once again attacked electric vehicles and the industry shift to electrify fleets thanks to major federal subsidies that South Carolina is taking advantage of and seeing billions of dollars in investment for EV chargers, batteries, and vehicle production. We are a nation whose leaders are demanding all electric cars. Even though they can't go far, they cost too much and whose batteries are produced in China with materials only available in China when an unlimited amount of gasoline is available inexpensively in the United States, but not available in China. Trump wrapped up his speech with classic phrases and vague promises that many in the crowd say only he can deliver on. But under our leadership, the forgotten men and women will be forgotten no longer. We are one movement, one people, one family, and one nation under God. And together, we will make America powerful again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. We will make America safe again. And we will make America great again. Thank you to South Carolina. Thank you very much, Pickens. Like I said a moment ago, Trump has and continues to enjoy a healthy lead in polls in the state, and that includes a recent one of likely South Carolina Republican voters. National Public Affairs poll found Trump has the lead with 41%, followed by DeSantis at 18%, Haley at 12%, Scott at 10%, and former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie at 5%. The top issues according to those 809 likely Republican voters was jobs, the economy, stopping illegal immigration, election integrity, protecting the Second Amendment, crime, and abortion. The poll was conducted between June 20th and the 21st. Sticking with 2024, President Joe Biden will be in West Columbia on Thursday, July 6th to continue his Bidenomics tour and cap a roadshow of cabinet secretaries who have recently visited the state to tout infrastructure investment thanks to the 2021 Bipartisan Infrastructure Law and the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act, which included $738 billion in spending on energy investment and to fight climate change. The IRA itself is set to bring $15 billion in large-scale clean power generation and storage to South Carolina between now and 2030, according to the Department of Energy. Biden will visit Flex Limited Manufacturing in West Columbia, which will announce a partnership with Enphase Energy. While the Republican-led South Carolina State House tries to pride itself on collaboration and avoiding the Washington gridlock that folks detest, there is still a difficult dance that House Republican leadership has been doing this year, though nowhere near the scale that's playing out in D.C. The Russ McKinney has this report on how a ruling on a lawsuit lodged by the South Carolina House Freedom Caucus will affect the future of the State House. Take a listen. Even though the General Assembly isn't in session this summer, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives finds itself in turmoil. 
following a recent federal court ruling which may have unintentionally blown a hole in the State Ethics Act. Since the 2022 election, a group of about 20 ultra-conservative Republican lawmakers has become a growing thorn in the side of the body's leadership. They've left the main GOP caucus and have formed their own South Carolina Freedom Caucus. In 2006, the legislature passed an ethics law that governs the campaign fundraising, spending, and reporting for members and the four major House caucuses, the Republican, Democratic, Black, and Women's caucuses. The law also specifically prohibits other special interest caucuses, like the Freedom Caucus, from raising money, hiring staff, or getting involved in political campaigns. Back in February, the Freedom Caucus sued the House Ethics Committee in federal court, claiming it should be entitled to operate in the same way as the major caucuses. Here's Representative Adam Morgan of Greenville, the Freedom Caucus chairman, announcing the lawsuit. Our political speech is muzzled by current ethics laws. Certain groups are disfavored. The Family Caucus, the Freedom Caucus, the Progressive Caucus, the Military Caucus, whatever caucus it might be, we are not allowed to engage in campaign activities, whereas the other caucuses are. Last month, Federal District Judge Cameron Curry agreed with the Freedom Caucus and issued a declaratory judgment that said all of the House caucuses should be afforded the same rights and privileges. By overturning the ethics law, some fear her ruling has opened the door so caucuses can be created willy-nilly and possibly leading to an influx of so-called dark money contributions. Even though the legislature isn't in session, the House Ethics Committee recently held an emergency meeting to review Judge Curry's order. Committee Chairman Jay Jordan of Florence said the status of the ethics laws when it comes to legislative caucuses is now clearly up in the air. The ramifications and the implications of um, where we stand, I think, are, are still murky, but it's clear that they're significant. Lexington Representative R.J. May, a member of the Freedom Caucus, doesn't see the matter as being murky at all. This judge's order couldn't be more clear. She said, if you treat the special legislative interest caucus, it needs to be treated like a legislative caucus. You can't have two sets of rules for two different people. Hence the reason that this was a clear 1A uh, and 14th Amendment violation. We did not ask uh, to be treated any differently. We simply asked to be put on the same footing, and that's exactly what this judge did. Some members of the House Ethics Committee, like Columbia Democrat Todd Rutherford, fear now there's a green light for the creation of special caucuses with the ability to raise undisclosed amounts of money, turning the caucus system into what one member called the Wild Wild West. What is clear is that this does blow a hole in the law of South Carolina as it relates to dark money and money coming in when two members of the General Assembly can get together and take cash donations in unlimited amounts and spend that in any way they see fit, that's a problem that anyone should see. It is what they petitioned for, and I guess they would have to answer why they did that, but that is the law currently in South Carolina. Again, R.J. May of the Freedom Caucus. I think they are uh, upset that there might be someone that challenges the ruling coalition of Republicans and Democrats in the State House. Because for far too long, the State House has not belonged to the people, it's belonged to special interests, it's belonged to lobbyists. Uh, but now they, we are seeing a, a crack in the establishment armor. The House Ethics Committee hopes to decide this month what course of action it should take. It could appeal Judge Curry's ruling, ask her to reconsider parts of it, or begin the tedious process of drafting a new ethics law. Thanks for that, Russ. And we'll continue to follow that story. But let's go from Columbia to Charleston now for a look at the new International African American Museum, which opened in June. South Carolina Public Radio's Victoria Hansen was one of the first to get a look at the stunning new museum. Built on 13-foot pillars, the museum rises above Gatson's Wharf, overlooking the Charleston Harbor. The wharf is where slave ships docked and 100,000 shackled Africans were forced ashore during the height of the transatlantic slave trade. The museum is lofted above the ground to honor the lives lost there. The opening ceremony was celebrated with passionate speeches, poetry, and West African drumming. Speaking before the crowd, former Charleston Mayor Joe Riley says he vowed to build this museum more than 20 years ago to teach what he was never taught. Africans were brutalized as slaves and forced to build a nation's wealth they did not share. Riley says those truths are important to our nation's narrative. Because truth sets us free, free to understand, 
free to respect. This museum explores the untold stories of the Africans who were brought to this place, the lives they lived, and how their labor shaped America. They are stories of bondage, but also resilience. Outside the museum, visitors are met with a powerful image evoking the earliest experience of Africans taken from their homes to lives of slavery. Now what you'll see on the ground are outlines of these human bodies. So That's public historian and tour guide Brandon Reed. He points to a shallow reflecting pool with engraved figures along the bottom. Each represents a man, woman, or child who was packed into the hull of a slave ship, unable to move for weeks or months. But this museum is about more than slavery. As visitors walk inside, they're surrounded by a series of towering video screens, flashing photographs set to music. The pictures show Africans and African Americans around the world, past and present. This is the museum's largest gallery, and it explores the transatlantic experience, from gut-wrenching depictions of the Middle Passage to joyous scenes of contemporary life. In all, there are nine galleries with more than 150 historical artifacts. In one, a wall displays the names and ages of Africans who were taken from their homeland. Jegwe, 21. Jimbi, 20. Jir, 7. Another wall shows the names those same people were given after they arrived at Gadsden's Wharf. Rachel, Eve, Jacob. In another exhibit, a worn, tattered sack sits in a glass case. It was given to a nine-year-old girl by her mother before the child was taken away from her. And it once held a lock of the mother's hair, a reminder for the girl of who she was. Dr. Tanya Matthews, the museum's CEO and president, says these displays are painful but important. I personally um, don't do safe spaces. I do courageous spaces. Matthew says that while the history the museum tells is difficult, the museum's opening is an achievement. When I stand at the edge of the wharf um, and, and look at what we're doing, I'm reminded that this is likely something that we survived for. She hopes the museum will create dialogue about race and inequality at a time when teaching those subjects in classrooms has become intensely controversial. Learning something new is never the enemy. Outside the museum, a black granite wall displays part of the Maya Angelou poem, And Still I Rise which visitors can see both coming and going. Yes, 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 and I rise, and I rise. Dr. And Bernard Powers, the museum's lead historian, has spent several years pushing this project forward. He vividly remembers the giant hole from excavation where remnants of the original wharf were found. A lot has arisen here so far, and there's much more to come. He hopes the museum will inspire and educate future generations. And thank you, Victoria, as well for that segment. You can find both of those stories, original reporting, and more at SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org. You'll be seeing a lot more news on that website as we continue to improve it over the coming months. And let's get some economic data for y'all since everyone loves talking about the economy. Yeah. Some good little talking points when people say, oh, the economy. Well, guess what, folks? The U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis recently gave their third estimate for the gross domestic product or GDP for the first quarter, which they revised to an annual rate of 2% for January through March. The GDP estimate for the first quarter, January through March, was revised up 0.7% from the second estimate primarily reflecting upward revisions to exports and consumer spending. Y'all did a lot of shopping January through March. Now, in the fourth quarter of 2022, real GDP increased by 2.6%. So just a little comparison there from the end of the year to the beginning of the year. And did you hit the road for July 4th like some 43.2 million Americans? That according to AAA, maybe you're still on the road like I am, question mark? Well, you've probably noticed that gas prices, while still high, are much lower than they were this time last year. The average price for a gallon of regular fuel in South Carolina is $3.12. That's down $1.17 a gallon from last year, when it was $4.29 a gallon. I mean, can you even imagine? Do you remember? Have you repressed it like I have? That's still lower than our $4.60 a gallon record high last June. Whew. 
Now, South Carolina has the sixth lowest average gas price in the country, and that's with that 12 cent gas tax increase having been fully phased in last year. I've definitely noticed some new pavement and better bridges out there as I've traveled the state. Have you? 803-563-7169, let us know. Welcome to the wind down section, our little break from the news. We're glad you're here. AT, I'm glad you're here, even though we are distant. I'm in Charleston, you're in Columbia. We are still here together. Oh, here we are. Uh, talking about July 4th, Independence Day. Oh, Just... July the 4th be with you, Gavin. Oh, you know thank what I mean? You. <laughs> you know, I, I think that's I... from that movie. <laughs> I, uh, I was thinking about that the other day and how we kind of made it through May and we didn't finish all the. Made the... I forgot to say it every day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. You, you. Did a good job with it. I failed. It's true. Gavin, he, after this, he's going to yell at me. Okay. When <laughs> we're out of here, he's going to yell at me. Embarrassing us. You're embarrassing me. You're embarrassing the pod. You're embarrassing this family because everything we, does come down we to We do family. not cut the wind down section. It is just one giant free flow. It's straight and through. So it's I like don't live. edit it. Yeah. We do it live. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Gavin, we got a call, okay? We yeah. didn't do it last week because it was too chalked full, okay? Too chalked full. This is sort of chalked medium, all right? And I so think people we, might, they, uh, they're they probably looking for a good wind down, a good call. We had a lot of Trump stuff. I know that was thorough, but we, let's, take a, <laughs> let's take a call. Okay, caller, let's call, go. Go ahead, caller. Go ahead, caller. Here we go. Hey, Gavin and AT, this is David from Columbia coming at you live from my late night drive back from Charleston. Uh, I was calling first to uh, say, AT, I'm glad that you and Bradley Fuller made it back uh, from Spoleto alive and in one piece. Uh, I'm really grateful for the recordings you all get while you are down there, but I know it is incredibly taxing uh, on you all. So just wanted to say thanks for that. And then second, uh, call in to see if we can get an 18th foot update. Uh, I was thinking about it the other day because I am training for a triathlon and I pulled a muscle in my leg. And when I was talking to my doctor about how we're going to rehab my leg, he threatened me with a boot. And I said, I will do literally anything to not wear a boot. And he said, well, anything includes water aerobics. So for the next three weeks, I will be doing water aerobics because that's the way I can work out my leg without putting any load on it. And all that made me think, huh, I wonder how AT's foot is doing. So calling to get an update on that. Hope you all are doing well. Uh, thanks for all your work on the pod. Really enjoy it. Bye. David from Columbia, thank you for that late night call and that drive back from Charleston. I know that is a <laughs> slog of a drive. I've been doing it so much, but the best way to do it is either early morning or late at night because 26 Fast can be... Fast as possible. Whew. Fast as possible. And yes, we were with. also happy that AT and Bradley made it back safely from Ugh. Charleston Spoleto. AT, just, we, we just, it was such a long month. Are you, have you recovered from that injury, that mental injury? <sighs> the, it's, <laughs> it's just so much work that it really takes a lot out of you. And um, I'm slowly getting better, but I am feeling my age. You know, I'm not mm. bouncing back like I used to. It's yeah. not like two days and better. Like uh, your foot injury. That, How's the, like, like the, bouncing back from that, huh? What a transition. I'm just here. Gavin. I'm cherry picking. I'm listening for segues and I'm implementing strategies. He's a facilitator. He's passing a foot the ball. facilitator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, my foot, it's never going to be on Foot Finder. It's all messed oh. up. Oh, <laughs> it was my so side delicate. hustle ruined. Um, so pure. No, uh, <laughs> it is a lot better. Speaking of like all those millions of Americans driving on the 4th of July. Yes. Caitlin and I drove to Myrtle Beach and we golfed three straight days and Beautiful. my foot survived it. That's but great. the fatal flaw, mm -mm. I forgot to bring my ice packs. And so. I didn't do my rehab stuff, and that third day of golf, the last seven holes, my foot was basically, I just had a cankle straight down. Oof. <laughs> yeah. Well, that could be good for foot finder. I think some people might like that. <laughs> um, were you in a hotel? You could just get an ice bucket and just keep filling that bucket up. It doesn't quite work the same as like a, a complete contact ice thing. Uh -huh. And so, David, I will say there are worse fates than water aerobics oh, yeah. in the middle of the summer you know like say, that, yeah. that's a pretty good fate to be 
dealt. And I say I mentioned the ice bucket because anytime I go to a hotel, I get the ice in the bucket and I put my feet in it. Like that's a hack. <laughs> that's a travel hack that guys will they will not tell you about. They, travel agents hate me for that. They it's hate, my thing. Yeah, yeah. That's how you save money, even though you're yeah, it's a, I'm I agree. pretty sure that's the ice bucket challenge. I don't know. I, I never really saw what that was. <laughs> well, yeah, but, but talking uh, about David, like you know, he's already in the pool training for that uh triathlon because I Gavin Jackson has done two sprint triathlons. No one's counting, no one's talking about it, but we you know he's done it. I've done <laughs> no it. Back in my twenties. No one's talking about this. <laughs> Back in my 20s, I did I did them. But now I'm like, I'm too terrified to bike on the roads in South Carolina. I'm terrified to drive on the roads in South Carolina. I know, it's scary. Let alone bike with no production. And then I just um I just I don't know, kind of got out of it. So but yeah, I'm I'm also ever since your injury, the the injury AT. The injury, capital T H E. You know, I go to the gym, but I'm still very terrified all the time with my legs and having injuries because of what you've gone through. Uh, we don't know how old David is, but like you and I, we are right in this Goldilocks zone for yeah. uh, tearing our our ligaments and 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 whatnot. And I'm turning and so, 37 on Saturday, so I know that. I, mean, I know I'm. I mean, well anywhere aware. from 20 to 37, 25 Any, to 37. Some people are saying even younger. I mean, some <laughs> people are saying younger. Uh, it just depends on who you ask. <laughs> and so, if I had to give a one takeaway from my disgusting ruined foot, yes. is that uh, listen to your doctors, mm. listen to your PTs. If they say to put a boot on, I, ah, David, I would say get that dang old boot on. I mean, it, you got to listen to them, do your exercises, do everything, and it, it ends up working out better if you do it that way. And we will be exclusively auctioning off AT's boot <laughs> for anyone with a size 11 and a half. Is that 11, 11, and, 11 and, and a half? half? Yeah. We wear the same boot. I'm, hopefully I won't need it. I'm knocking on wood. Uh, it will be signed. It'll be used. Like we said, you cannot, uh, you know, use that for anything other than medical use. <laughs> no resale. No, no resale. resale. No you resale. have to sign a contract. No, <laughs> no resale. <laughs> yeah. It's like getting a car seat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good to hear from David. So, uh, yeah, AT, and you had a good July 4th, I take it? I honestly didn't do anything yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, so because I golfed, I was outside for four straight days That's a lot in for Myrtle you. Beach. That's a lot for you. And so yesterday, I just wanted to sit inside. So I played Zelda for a long time, but... Uh, I survived. I persevered. I shot an 83. I'm very, very cool. And I, a lot of people are saying that. Anyway, uh, next week, I'll, I'll be talking to you from Maine, Gavin, wow. from Parts Unknown. Dot, dot, so, dot. I don't know where I'll be, but you'll be in Maine. How exciting. We'll see how our internet connection is. Please call in. Please give us content to talk about. We need content. I'm, I'm very, very tired. And He's always tired. We need um, content. This guy is always tired. I Doctors got both this my guy. feet in ice buckets right now. And if you're and, in a hotel, uh, get the ice, put your feet in there. You're going to thank me. You're going you're gonna to love the way you look. I guarantee it. Anyway, Gavin, give the outro. All right, thank folks. You, David. Be like David. We love give you us a all. shout. 803-563-7169. We love hearing from you guys. You can also show us your appreciation by leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also stay up to date with the latest news on SCETV.org and South Carolina Public Radio.org. And don't forget to support your local newspapers. For the South Carolina lead, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina. Bow, bow, bow. <laughs> Hello, welcome to LEDE EDM fans. Up, 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 up. Keep going. <laughs> we are the lead boys. Keep going, yes. <laughs> maximum. Oh, you weren't going to say anything else? No, maximum. maximum.